NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory presents the Von Karman Lecture, a series of talks by scientists and engineers who are exploring our planet, our solar system, and all that lies beyond. Hey, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. How's everyone tonight? Excellent. <laughs> hey, Jane. <laughs> well, anyway, thank you guys all so much for coming out tonight. Volcanoes have helped transform the surface of the Earth, the other terrestrial planets, and the Moon. However, the biggest volcanic eruptions in the solar system are taking place not on Earth, but on Io, a moon of Jupiter. This wonder of the solar system is a fascinating laboratory where powerful eruptions result from tidal heating. Despite multiple spacecraft visits and spectacular new observations with Earth-based telescopes, some of the biggest questions about Io's volcanism remain unanswered. Getting the answers requires a few things. Understanding the difficulties of remote sensing of volcanic activity, innovating a new approach to instrument design, and ultimately returning to Io. Our guest tonight will describe how studying volcanoes on Earth leads to a clear understanding of how Io's volcanoes work and how best to study them. Tonight's guest is a research scientist and volcanologist here at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. He received a doctorate in volcanology from Lancaster University in the UK in 1988 and has been at JPL for over 20 years. He was a member of the Galileo NIMS team, is a co-investigator on the Europa Clipper Mapping Imaging Spectrometer for Europa, has written over 100 papers on observing and understanding volcanic processes, and is the pardon me, and is the author of Volcanism on Io, A Comparison with Earth, published by the Cambridge University Press. He continues to be engaged in research into volcanic eruption processes, spacecraft mission and instrumentation development, and field work on volcanoes around the world. He was also a co-recipient of the NASA Software of the Year Award for the Autonomous Sciencecraft Experiment, which successfully demonstrated science-driven full spacecraft autonomy. His love of volcanoes is truly undeniable. Every year, he sends his PhD advisor a birthday card depicting a work of great art improved with a volcano. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome tonight's guest, Dr. Ashley Davis. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all very much for coming. The surface of the moon and the surfaces of the terrestrial planets have all been extensively modified by extreme volcanic activity in their distant pasts. And these large eruptions are mostly unknown in the manner in which they emplaced large, vast fields of lava. But there was one place in the solar system where such voluminous, powerful, extensive flows uh, volcanic eruptions are taking place, and that is the Jovian moon Io. Io holds some fascinating views of how Earth might have erupted in its distant past, is a key to understanding the evolution of the large Jovian satellites, and is a great template for looking for volcanically active exoplanets. It's truly an amazing place to a volcanologist. I think I have a pretty cool job because I study volcanoes for NASA. And although this usually means that I spend most of my time staring at a computer screen and crunching data and looking at remote sensing uh, observations of, of volcanic eruptions, occasionally they let me out to go and play on a real volcano somewhere. And it's a great job. It's very exciting. And it's taken me to the ends of the Earth. Um, this is, in the background here, we have Mount Erebus. It is the world's most suddenly active volcano in Antarctica. At the summit, there is uh, a crater with a lava lake in it. This is in Ethiopia. And again, we, over on the right, we see another lava lake uh, on a volcano called Erta Ale. Now, it's important to think about volcanoes and what they mean for the evolution of a planet. But apart from that, volcanic eruptions are an agent for change which can affect millions of people uh, very quickly. 
this is Mount St. Helens erupting in 1980. And on Earth, over 250 million people live within 20 kilometers of a volcano that can erupt like this. Apart from that, moving away from the human element, volcanoes are a window into the interior of the Earth or any other planet. They are an indication of internal heating, which has melted the upper mantle. And they conveniently transport material from the inside of a planet to the surface, where it can be observed with instruments on spacecraft. And there are many styles of volcanic activity on Earth. And I've been spending most of my time looking at low viscosity basalt type, erup type eruptions at lava lakes. A lava lake is the top of a column of magma connected to a magma chamber. Uh, it's an open system around which magma circulates. And they're quite rare on Earth. They, they tend to crop up in, in quite extreme environments, although there is a big one in Hawaii now. But they're very useful for, for studying basaltic processes. And I've been studying these on Earth to better understand what's happening on Io. Now, the Galilean satellites were discovered by the great uh, Italian astronomer, Galileo Galilei, uh, in, on the, on the uh, 9th of January, uh, 1610. Uh, Galileo noted in his, in his notebook uh, that using this new Dutch invention, the telescope, he observed Jupiter and noted these little stars uh, close to Jupiter and noted that over the next few nights, the position of these, of these dots would change. And came to the conclusion these were actually orbiting, these were actually moons orbiting Jupiter. So we can jump forward 400 years to the Voyager spacecraft. Built, there were two of these built here at JPL. And Voyager flew through the, the, the Jupiter system. And on Io made one of the greatest discoveries uh, that, of planetary science. Uh, that Io had these large volcanic plumes. And this was a, a real revolution in our understanding of the outer solar system, because up to this point, uh, it was generally thought that the moons of, the, of the, the outer solar system planets were small, dead worlds, where over geological time, the geological processes that, that were changing them had, had basically been damped down into nothing. They were small, cold ice balls. But here we have Io being a dynamic, evolving world. The follow-up mission to Voyager was fittingly called Galileo. And uh, I was on the Near Infrared Mapping Spectrometer team, NIMS. And here we see, in the lower right, uh, an observation of Io with NIMS. Uh, NIMS was an instrument that was particularly good at detecting the heat given off from volcanic eruptions. And and sent back a lot of data. Now, the, the NIMS, the Galileo main antenna didn't open. Uh, and so there was a restriction on the amount of data that came back. And so there are still some gaps on, on IO that need to be filled in terms of coverage. So here we have the four large Galilean satellites uh, as imaged by uh, the imaging system on the Galileo spacecraft, IO, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. Io is closest to Jupiter, and Callisto is furthest away. And here we have Io, as seen by the camera system uh, on, on the Galileo spacecraft. And the colors of, of Io's surface are diagnostic of, of composition. If it's yellow, it's rich in sulfur. Uh, white areas are rich in sulfur dioxide. <coughs> But what's of great interest to me are the black areas and the red areas. The black areas are areas of silicate volcanism. This is where material like basalt is being erupted onto the surface. The red areas are thought to be short-chain sulfur allotropes, which are evidence of active or ongoing volcanic activity. So every black or red area on this, in this image is, uh, is an active or very recently active volcano. Now, the amazing thing about Io is that it's actually volcanic at all. Here we have Io next to the moon. And the moon was once 
very volcanic. These dark areas are the mare, and these are layers of basalt many kilometers thick. But the moon is, as far as we can tell, volcanically dead. And this is because what drove volcanism on the moon and what continues to drive volcanism on Earth is internal heating by the decay of radioisotopes. This is material that was incorporated into the planets and moons when they formed. Now, the laws of physics dictate that a small body loses heat faster than a large body does. So over billions of years, the moon and Mercury and Mars lost their internal heat to space. The heat that was driving this volcanological engine within each planet slowed down, and it eventually stopped, and large-scale volcanism on these bodies was still forever. So this is what happens with a, with a small body with an internal source of energy. But with Io, something very different is happening. Io's source of energy, which drives its volcanism, is external. Io, Europa, and Ganymede are in an orbital resonance. For every orbit that Ganymede makes around Jupiter, Europa makes two orbits, and Io makes four orbits. So every time you, Io passes, for example, Europa, Io gets a little kick, and it's taken Io's orbit and changed it from a circular orbit into a slightly elliptical orbit with a bit, a bit more eccentric orbit. And Io gets twisted each time it passes one of the other two satellites, and it's this tidal flexing that generates heat within Io that manifests at the surface as active volcanism. So it's an external source driving this extraordinary level of volcanic activity on Io. Uh, it's an elegant cosmic ballet, if you like, choreographed by the immutable laws of physics. Now, just to put the majestic scale of Io's volcanism into some sort of context, this is the amount of material that has erupted from Earth's volcanoes every year. Most of this has erupted on the ocean floor at mid-ocean ridges. On Io, this is the amount of material that's erupted every year to erase any evidence of impact craters. There are no impact craters on Io, unlike any other solid body in the solar system. So there really is a truly astonishing amount of volcanic activity taking place. Over the years, we've collected a lot of data from, from spacecraft, and this is a mosaic uh, compiled from the best Voyager and Galileo spacecraft data. And basically, we've covered most of Io at resolutions good enough to identify volcanoes from their appearance and their thermal emission. And to this has been added a growing data set, uh, an astonishing library of observations obtained with large telescopes based here on Earth. This is from the Keck telescope in Hawaii. And these are telescopes equipped with adaptive optics. And uh, this is measuring the, the heat from, uh, from a, a whole series of, of hotspots. And so putting all of these data sets together, we've been able to catalog all of the volcanoes on Io and quantify their thermal emission. This plot shows 250 volcanoes erupting on, uh, which have been recently or currently uh, erupting on, on Io. Uh, and these range in size from areas of just a few hundred square meters to vast multi kilometer areas of incandescent material. Uh, rare thermal outbursts actually marked here by, by squares. These are rare and transient. So, uh, eat the the size of these symbols, each, uh, the larger the symbol, the more energy is coming out. And this is actually on a logarithmic scale. But the, the heat flow from Io is not even. There are areas where we, we see a, a, a deficit of heat flow and other areas where we see a lot of heat flow. And this isn't really ma matched very well to the models that we have of uh, either shallow or deep heating. So there's still a lot about the way in which tidal heating is linked to the delivery of lava at the surface. Well, let's take a look at some of these amazing volcanoes. Uh, this is a great image obtained by Galileo, uh, which shows a volcano here called Prometheus. 
Uh, this is a volcano which generates a large plume about 100 kilometers high, which lays down this circular deposit, which is rich in sulfur dioxide. And in the middle of this, uh, this uh, plume deposit is a, a lava flow field, which was emplaced between the Voyager and the Galileo missions in, the, in a period of about 16 years. So we can go in and take a closer look at this. Here we have the, the flows at Prometheus. And for scale, we have uh, an image of Earth's most active basalt volcano. This is Kilauea in Hawaii. And uh, this is the, the area of flows which was in place in about the same time. So the, the area of flows here is, is, uh, is over a, well, well over 1,000 square kilometers. And it's uh, actually over 2,000 square kilometers. It's about the area of, of Rhode Island. And this was in place in just 16 years. This is a particularly interesting uh, uh, volcano because uh, what we uh, think is happening here is that lava is coming up at a vent here and then passing through a lava tube system before erupting out at the distal ends of the flows. Very much like what we see in Hawaii. And a, a logical explanation is lava tube transportation uh, of, uh, of new lava uh, which is a great way of transporting lava a, a great distance without it cooling and solidifying. But along the way, we see these tantalizingly faint, small thermal sources, which could be breakouts onto the surface or skylights, which are holes in the roof of a lava tube. And I'll certainly be coming back and discussing those <coughs> later. Io's most powerful volcano is, is in a feature called Loki Patera. And the general consensus is that this is actually a large lava lake. But it's a lava lake 180 kilometers across, so it's probably better to call it a lava sea. It is Io's most persistent, powerful volcano. And we think that it has a very unique way of being resurfaced. We think that what is happening at Loki Patera is that the crust on the lava lake forms with time and it thickens with time until it gets to a point where the crust starts to sink. And then basically the entire surface of the lava lake is resurfaced by this crust sinking and the sinking crust being replaced with new lava. This is an analysis of a single Galileo NIMS observation that was obtained in 2001, and it shows a temperature map and age map of the surface from the analysis of the data. And what this implies is that this resurfacing wave, if you like, swept around the Patera at a rate of about a kilometer a day. So what happens is the Patera resurfaces, resurfaces itself, and then it remains quiescent for a while while the crust thickens, and then the crust sinks again. And it's been doing this periodically for decades. Well, in 2015, <coughs> in 2015, the Large Binocular Telescope Interferometer, which is on a mountaintop in Arizona, collected this truly astonishing set of observations, which shows Europa passing across and eclipsing or occulting Loki Patera. So Loki Patera is here. And this is Europa passing across in front of Io, between Io and the telescope on Earth. And what this means is that as Europa's edge passes across Loki Patera, it covers up the Patera in one direction. And we get this light curve here as light is cut off and heat is cut off. But as Europa uncovers Loki Patera, we get this curve with the limb going in a different direction. And so by fitting these little squiggles in the data set, we created, and this is an effort led by Catherine DeClear, who's now at Caltech, we created the highest spatial resolution map of Loki Patera's surface that's ever been obtained, even including data from spacecraft. We managed to create a map over the entire Patera floor. And fitting this lava lake model to it, 
and looking at the distribution of temperatures on the surface from which you can infer age, because the older the surface, the cooler it is. The explanation that we came up with for this particular temperature distribution was this. Two resurfacing waves sweeping around the Patera to form this resulting temperature distribution, which was observed by the Large Binocular Telescope Interferometer. And this is something which is consistent with previous observations, and it's, it's, a, it's a, a really nice vindication of, of this lava lake resurfacing model. A more active lava lake on Io is at Pele. And Pele is at the center of this bright red deposit, which is a plume deposit, a plume fallout. It's a plume that's hundreds of kilometers high, and it's led to this deposit on the surface, rich in short-chain sulfur allotropes, uh, about 1,200 kilometers across. And we think that Pele it has every appearance of an active overturning lava lake with a, the plume basically forcing its way up through the middle of the lake uh, and disrupting the surface, uh, yielding, uh, revealing high temperature lava. And it's much larger. It's about 38 kilometers across and much larger than its terrestrial uh, equivalents. This is the Kupainaha Lava Lake in Hawaii. Uh, terrestrially, lava lakes are maybe 10 or 20, up to 100 or 200 meters in diameter. Io's volcanoes, Io's lava lakes seem to be hundreds or even thousands of, uh, of kilometers, uh, square kilometers in size. Uh, Loki Patera itself, Loki Patera has uh, a surface area of over 21,000 square kilometers, which makes it even larger than West Virginia. Io's most powerful eruptions uh, thermal outbursts uh, are now known to be caused by large lava fountains gushing for, forth from long fissures. And these sort of events were actually seen. A couple of them were seen by Galileo. And the, this is what's happening along this, this fissure here. And this is the result of saturation because so much energy was being uh, received by the, the spacecraft, um, the detector saturated. And this is a problem that we've come across time and time again with trying to image these very powerful events. We now see these things from uh, Earth-based telescopes. They're actually discovered by Earth-based telescopes back in the 1990s. But we're continuing to discover these. Uh, they're quite rare, and they're quite short-lived, but they're very powerful. In 2013, we saw two of these at Rarog and Heno Patere uh, in the southern hemisphere of Io. This, in, this is an interesting image because it, it does show that at short wavelengths, that Loki Patera does not emit a lot of energy. Most of the energy being emitted from Loki is at longer wavelengths. And what that tells us is that, generally speaking, Loki is a relatively cool surface uh, compared with what we see at these outbursts. So for the purposes of determining eruption temperature of the lava, Loki Patera may not be our best candidate, whereas something like Pele, where we have overturning lava lakes, uh, an overturning lava lake on a much shorter time scale, is a better candidate. So by looking at all of this data and doing a lot of modeling, and, and uh, we come up with, uh, we've come up with a, a classification schema where we can, we can identify the characteristic thermal fingerprints of different styles of volcanic activity. The most powerful eruptions are these outburst eruptions, these large lava fountain events. We have the Pele overturning lava lake right here. And at the bottom, we have these small but powerful lava tube skylights. These are small but, but very high temperature. I'll be talking more about these later. So Io is a, a fascinating body uh, in terms of it was the first body where we really did see active resurfacing processes. But the Voyager, Cassini, and Galileo missions have shown that uh, there are many other satellites in the solar system which have uh, this dynamic, evolving uh, structure. For example, we have Enceladus, which is one of the moons of uh, Saturn, which has uh, water plumes erupting from the south polar region. And we have Titan and the uh, Jovian satellite Europa, which have geologically young surfaces. 
But IO and all of these bodies are, to some extent, tidally heated. But IO is the most tidally heated body uh, in the solar system, and it's probably the best place to, to, to study this extreme, the, the extreme limits of, of, of this process. So the big picture, as it stands, is that we know that IO and Europa are, are tidally uh, bound uh, together. Uh, and, uh, but how much heating is, and where this heating is taking place within the satellites is not really well constrained. But as tidal heating is most pronounced at IO, it's, it's really knowing IO's interior condition that gives us some insight into further constraining how much heat is being input into Europa. So on IO, it's the eruption temperature of IO's lavas which could be diagnostic of interior conditions. And so looking to IO's volcanoes to get these data is what we need to do uh, as a way of constraining the interior state of IO. So the big question in the wake of the Galileo mission regarding volcanism and IO is what is the composition of the silicate lavas on IO? This reflects what's happening inside. We know that IO's volcanism is dominated by uh, low viscosity, quite fluid lava, like basalt. Basalt erupts at about uh, 11, 1140 centigrade. And this is, quite a, this is the most common uh, volcanic material in the solar system. But it's also possible that with Io, on Io, that we have uh, a type of lava called ultramafic lava, uh, one, of which, uh, uh, one of which is a comatiite, is a And this erupts at hundreds of, of, of centigrade uh, higher temperatures. Um, and this is interesting to us because ultramafic lavas were once common on Earth, in Earth's distant past. When, and it might have been a time when this reflected uh, a hotter mantle uh, in the Earth. So if ultramafic lavas are indeed erupting on Io, I would truly be uh, a window back into, into Earth's uh, geological past. Now, the hotter the lava, the more interior heating is taking place, and the more liquid the interior. Uh, but it's very difficult to tell the difference between uh, ultramafic and basaltic lavas by temperature alone. Firstly, we have to look at a very narrow part of the thermal emission spectrum. Uh, and secondly, uh, the problem here, and this is something that, that has, has, has bedeviled efforts to do this with remote sensing, is that uh, we're trying to tell the difference between a lava that erupts at a very high temperature and something that erupts at a very, very high temperature. So comatiites, it only takes a couple of seconds for a comatiite uh, erupting at this, at this temperature of, say, 1850 Kelvin to cool down to the temperature with, at which basalt erupts. And so it's very difficult to tell uh, one from the other. And if you're going to go to Io and look at, at styles of volcanic activity to try and do this, only certain styles of, of, of volcanic activity will do. And the first is uh, lava fountains. And this is something we have to get pretty close to and image, say, the base of the lava fountain before the lava that's gushing out of the ground uh, can, uh, can cool too much. Um, and the problem with this is that these are relatively rare and it's impossible to predict where, where these are going to happen. Lava tube skylights are a particularly good candidate for doing this because uh, they're, they're small, you have a very high temperature uh, gradient uh, between the, the, the lava tube skylight and the surrounding area, so these things stick out very well. And the temperatures inside are very close to eruption temperature because the lava tube itself is, is highly insulating. And then we have lava, lava lakes. And what we're interested uh, about in lava lakes is the, the fountaining that takes place because it's the fountaining events that reveal the lava uh, at its highest temperatures. So I've been traveling around and looking at lava lakes and taking models of uh, volcanic activity to understand how best to measure lava eruption temperature. So a few years ago, I went to uh, Erebus in Antarctica. Uh, this is, uh, uh, these are observations obtained by uh, uh, a satellite in Earth orbit. Uh, Earth observing one, and uh, this is a, a visible image 
and this is an infrared image, and we can see the lava lake here with a smaller pit. And I'm actually standing in a pixel about here <laughs> as, this, as this was taken. Um, and here I am uh, at about uh, 13,000 feet on Mount Erebus. And it's a bright, sunny summer day. Uh, and uh, the temperature, uh, the ambient temperature, without wind chill, is about minus 40 centigrade. And at the summit, oh, this is our camp. Uh, this is at about 11,000 feet. Um, this is, the, this is the, the summit of Erebus. And at the summit, there's a crater about 600 meters across, and it's about 250 meters deep. And in that crater, there is an active lava lake of a, a, a lava called phonolite. It's quite a rare composition. And this is the lava lake itself. It's about 38 meters across, and quite one of the extraordinary, most extraordinary things uh, I've ever seen. And uh, I took down a, uh, a thermal imager, a FLIR thermal imager with me. And, uh, and this, this is the data, some of the data that, that was collected. And what we see here is that lava is welling up in the center of the lake, forming a crust, which then moves laterally. And then the lava goes down at the, at the edges. And this has been circulating around between the surface and the deep-seated a uh, magma chamber about three or four kilometers down. So uh, this was a great test of a model that, that was created to, to determine the temperature and area distribution. And this is just a cartoon of that model. We have lava rising up, spreading, and then sinking. So there is a, a mathematically defined progression in cooling across the surface of the lake. And if you integrate over that, yeah, and then you can compare that with the data. This is what we got, and this was this was great. This was a great pleasure to me to to actually do this because the the model fit to the data. Um, we produced the thermal emission as a function of wavelength, the total power emitted, and the area of the lava lake just down to a few percent. So this is very gratifying. Um, there was a slight discrepancy in the fit between the model down here, and that is just basically because. The model used a basaltic composition. Um, and it was only the, the lava eruption temperature that was different. And that's why there's a slight gap here. So it looks like the model is actually very sensitive to temperature. And this improves our confidence of, uh, of fitting data that we get from, from spacecraft. Now, the resurfacing mechanism at, at, uh, at Erebus was generally very quiescent. But uh, when I was there in 2005, every, every six to nine hours, the lava lake would resurface itself like this. <laughs> I have to do my own special effects. Well, that's what it sounded like. It was pretty impressive when this thing blew. So yeah, this is a Strombolian eruption. And it basically throws out lava bombs up to uh, 3 quarters of a kilometer. So you've got to be careful. <laughs> yeah. OK, all the bad acting aside, um, the guy under the rock, uh, his name's Alexander Gerst. And uh, at the time, he was a. Um, he was a graduate student at the University of Hamburg. And now he's, uh, he's an astronaut in the European Space Agency Astronaut Corps. And he's already spent one tour on the International Space Station. And he's mission commander on a mission that's going to be launched in 2018. Well done, Alexander. So for the results from the field trip to Mount Erebus and all the data analysis is that we we see that lava lake thermal signatures, the character characteristic thermal signature of a, of a lava lake on Earth and its contemporaries on Io are actually pretty similar. Uh, the model fits used to interpret the Io data. The model was actually developed to interpret Io data. It actually works really well on terrestrial data. So that's, that's, that's a good test. And the analysis appears to be sensitive to eruption temperatures, which is important. So this is all very well at Erebus. But Things, how do things look with a better analog for IO? 
And so a few years later, um, actually I was asked to go out to this volcano in Africa, the Erta Ale volcano in the Danakil Depression, in the Afar region of, of Ethiopia by the BBC, who were filming a series called uh, Wonders of the Solar System. And I was obviously a wonder of the solar system. And so um, they, wanted, they wanted to talk to me about it out there. I jumped at the chance. Uh, Erta Ale is located at the, the northern end of the East African Rift System. Uh, this is where Africa is, is pulling itself apart. And it's a basalt lava lake. And here it is. Uh, in 2009, it was about 55 meters across. It, there was a lot of vigorous churning around at the edges and the occasional lava fountain in the middle. And it's one of the most extraordinary things that I've ever seen. And so here I am on the summit of Erta Ale on a bright, sunny summer day. And the ambient temperature is 133 Fahrenheit. It's 56 centigrade. So it's not surprising I look a little pink. Um, <laughs> Again, with a the thermal image. And these lava lakes tend to be in these really you know, extreme environments. Here I am again with another thermal imager. And this is an hour in the life of the lava lake, compressed down into about 10 seconds of time lapse. And what I'd like to point out is a small lava fountain just about here. There it goes. This is where. The crust is being disrupted, and areas at very high temperature are being revealed. And that's what we're interested in. So I, I took a look at these data to determine what the effect would be of any kind of delay in getting data at different wavelengths. A traditional way for spacecraft, like Voyager, spacecraft images to work is you take an image of the surface through one filter. You move a filter wheel. You take another image through another filter wheel. Uh, through another filter on the wheel, you move the filter again. You take another image. Then you combine those images together, and you get a color image. What is the, uh, that's fine for planetary surfaces. But where we have something that is changing rapidly because it's actually cooling very fast, what is the effect of that when you try this experiment again? And this is what we found, that with even a second delay, in taking data at different wavelengths, we got these massive, here we go, these massive changes in derived temperature, which really does make it very difficult to have any confidence in an actual temperature derivation. But when you cut the difference in time down to a fraction of a second, we get a, we get a much smaller amount of variation. Of course, this would be this would be a flat line if the data were obtained simultaneously. So what we found from Erta Ale is that temperatures, that areas at target temperatures change so rapidly that observations have to be obtained very fast, and ideally simultaneously at different wavelengths. Now with Galileo data, we tried deriving temperatures from Galileo data by combining different SSI frames and combining NIMS data with SSI data. And we found that with seconds and minutes between observations, we, 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 it damages our confidence in the results, because the target that we're looking at was probably changing in that time. Now, this is not a criticism of Galileo by any means of the imagination, because the instruments of Galileo were simply not designed to do what, we wanted, what we'd like to do with the next mission. We see as far as we do because we stand on the shoulders of giants. So this is not a criticism of Galileo at all. And the upshot of this is that observations have to be obtained in a fraction of a second. So we're really getting close now to what we need to overcome these problems. Um, we have a very good handle on the derivation of the style of volcanic activity from studying volcanoes on Earth and studying volcanoes on Io. Um, on that note, uh, there was a paper published just last year where we quantified the thermal emission that you would get from a lava tube skylight for both bas basalt and ultramafic compositions. So now we have the distinctive thermal fingerprints for both of these 
compositions to help us analyze any new spacecraft data that we might get of volcanism on Io, or this style of volcanism on Io. We have a very good handle on the rapid cooling of new lava. We know how the process works, and we know some of the, some of the problems that have to be overcome with that. Um, and with lava fountains and with, uh, over, uh, with fountaining in lava lakes, there is still the problem of the unpredictable magnitude of thermal emission, because if, you get, if, the, if too, much, too much radiance is, is captured by the detector, uh, it will saturate. And then the data are no good for deriving eruption temperature. But there are, there's a number of ways of doing it, and here's one. Um, this is an, an effort uh, being led by Alex Soibel here at JPL. Um, it uses uh, something called the hot bird detector, which, is, which was invented here at JPL, and an integrated circuit that was invented at MIT Lincoln Labs. And it splits the signal coming in. Uh, it obtains data simultaneously at multiple wavelengths. For our purposes, the detector and the circuit are non-saturating, so there's no saturation effect, and it's got a fast integration time. So this is just one approach that can be used to get the data that we need to measure lava eruption temperatures on IO accurately. So now we really do have all of the pieces of the puzzle. We can identify different eruption styles on IO, and we can understand and we, know, we have a good understanding of how these different eruptions behave thermally and temporally. So we really do know what observations to make. We have some designs for instruments to collect the data. And we have models that can be used to interpret the data once obtained. And now, the only thing we're missing now are new data. So the unlocking of IO secrets has been an incremental process. Uh, the Voyager spacecraft discovered that Io was volcanically active, and, but it, it did so with instruments that were not designed for looking at any kind of silicate volcanism. This was completely unthought of when the instruments were designed in the first place. Galileo discovered that silicate volcanism was the dominant form of volcanism on Io. And now the question is, what is the actual composition of the lavas? Is it uniform across Io, or are there different compositions being being erupted in different places which reflect the depth of origin of these lavas. Are they hot or are they very hot? So really, a new mission is needed to get back to Io. And there have been different missions proposed over the years. This is one that was proposed a couple of years ago. It may be proposed again by Alfred McEwen at uh, the University of Arizona. It's called the Io Volcano Observer, or IVO. IVO. And other missions like it would be the first mission sent back to Io dedicated to studying Io's volcanoes and the interior processes with instruments designed specifically to overcome the problems, uh, the problems that are inherent in trying to understand what's happening on Io, to finally nail down eruption temperatures, constrain interior state, and then this can be applied also to Europa. So in conclusion, we really, truly are living in a new, in a golden age of exploration. Um, we, know how, we know the big IO questions can be answered. And to a volcanologist, IO is a truly amazing place. It's a window into Earth's past. It's key to understanding Jupiter's satellites. It's a volcanologist's paradise. Thank you very much. Uh, if anyone has uh, any questions, uh, please uh, use the microphone set up in the middle of the room. Hi, uh, great presentation. Um, I had a quick question with regards to the potential for an atmosphere on Io. So um, is there any indication there was an atmosphere, or is there an atmosphere? Will there be an atmosphere in the future? There is a, a, a very, very thin atmosphere of sulfur dioxide, which appears to freeze out at night. Uh, it's not as thick as Earth's atmosphere. We're talking about something that is uh, just a, a tiny fraction of a bar. And it's basically sulfur dioxide that's generated from, from the volcanoes themselves. 
and by lava flowing across the surface and and uh, uh, melting or uh, melting and, and remobilizing uh, sulfur dioxide uh, gas and sulfur on the surface, That's remobilizing ices. Hi, I'm just wondering if you have any plans to visit more volcanoes or if you, any I, specific ones you'd like to go to. Uh, I try to visit as many volcanoes as I can. Uh, I made my first trip to Etna this year, which is very exciting. Um, that's where I encountered the, the, sort of the mantra of the volcanologist, which was, uh, well, you should have stayed an extra couple of days. Usually it's, you should have been here last week. In this case, I left a couple of days before it erupted quite spectacularly. Um, I, I would like to go back to Erta Ale uh, with, with new equipment. Uh, I'd like to go, I spend a lot of time at Kilauea, because Kilauea is, is convenient, it's relatively close, and it's a great analog for a lot of the styles of volcanic activity that we see on Io. So it's a great test bed, and it's a great learning experience to go out and watch the, watch the eruptions take place. Yeah. Uh, hi. I understand there are about 400 active volcanoes on Io uh, contributing to the ejecta and also to the plasma torus. And my question is, uh, are there any dormant volcanoes on Io or do you know of any that are going dormant? Um, we've, we've identified 250 locations where there's been active or recent volcanism, uh, and there are, as you quite correctly say, there are about 400 sites on Io which, which look like dormant, which, which, there are 400 sites on Io which, which uh, uh, have the appearance of past activity as well as, uh, as, well as the, the, the current activity. So yes, there, there are uh, many sites on Io which look as if they once were volcanic but don't appear to be volcanic now. I don't think that there's been any correlation between where the activity is taking place now and where it seemed to have taken place at some other time. So there may be something hidden in those data which reflect a, a shift in, in, in maybe regional volcanism, but no, I, I can't say anything definitive about that uh, right now. Thank you. Yeah, welcome. So first of all, thank you very much for your presentation. It's been very eye-opening. Um, uh, <laughs> I'm not intended, I promise. Um, so the, uh, my question is, have we been able to detect a magnetic field around IO? And if not, what's the, what's the theory for what's missing in development for that magnetic field? Um, you know, I'm not sure of the answer. We, we've, we've, the Galileo magnetometer uh, did, some, uh, did some measurements as it went past Io, which did infer that uh, there was, uh, through, through magnetic induction, that there was a, uh, a, uh, a global magma ocean. Um, I'm not sure about the, the, the strength and size of, of Io's magnetic field. Thank you very much. Hi. Um, my question is, do we have an understanding of the mechanism for emplacement of the, the, the magma at the surface? Is there some sort of tectin tectonism going on that is a mechanism for that? Right. Oh, we don't think there's any um, sort of global tectonics the way we see global tectonics on Earth. Instead, we have a, a heat pipe mechanism where, where, where lava or well, magma works its way up from the top of the, of the lithosphere to the surface. Um, what helps it get there is, 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 seems to be uh, a, a trend for large faults in the crust, uh, providing planes of weakness and re reducing stress, uh, horizontal stress, which provides pathways for lava to get to the surface. And the problem with Io is it's being resurfaced so fast that the crust is getting compressed down. And so very large horizontal stresses uh, build up. Um, and these stresses are relieved by large crustal blocks tilting and by, and by faulting in other, in other areas. And these seem to provide pathways for lava to get to the surface. So the thick, the thick crust uh, seems to be uh, fractured uh, sufficiently to allow the, 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 the passage of, of lava 
passage of magma to the surface uh, in, in many locations. But there are no plate tectonics like, like what we see on Earth. There's fracturing, but there's no... There's fracturing, movement. but yeah. there's no subduction, yeah. and there's no sort of... Uh, there, don't see, there don't seem to be any spreading centers. Okay, thank you. Hi, you may not be able to answer this, but I can't help but wondering if the Europa Clipper might be carrying an instrument that perhaps in an extended mission right. could collect some of the data that you're looking for from IO. Yeah, um, we're still trying to figure out what to look at on Europa with Europa Clipper. And uh, Europa Clipper is not going to make any close passes to IO because IO is deep in Jupiter's uh, radiation belt. So I think the best, the best chance for understanding IO's volcanism is with a dedicated IO, IO mission. Uh, two questions. Uh, the, the second one, I guess, was already answered. That we're not going to Europa Clipper isn't going to help here. Uh, so. If, if the energy for all this activity is coming from the tidal forces between the different uh, satellites, is there enough energy in that uh, orbital motion to power the heat for the whole lifetime of the solar system and for a billion years in, in the future? Um, it looks like Io, one of the theories about Io and Europa and Ganymede is that they move in and out of this orbital resonance. So what we see is a complicated byplay between orbital dynamics and the interior structure of, of Io, Europa, and Ganymede. So it looks like on a scale of, of maybe hundreds of millions of years, Io and the other satellites may move in and out of the resonance, which would actually cut off volcanism on Io. So it might be that Io is going through, at the moment, a very high level of volcanic activity because it's at a peak in this scale. Um, we don't really know, but that's important because uh, you get to the point where uh, Io's interior is so fluid that the tidal forces end up moving, just basically moving the fluid around, and uh, volcanism will actually come to an end uh, once, once it moves out of the resonance. Uh, then once, it, the, once it's out of the resonance and the tidal forces can get a grip on a, on a solid IO again, it will move back into resonance and volcanism will start again. And this might happen so quickly that, that we get total mixing of the or total melting of the, of, the, of, the, of the interior so that we go back to basalt, we go back to possibly ultramafic material. Uh, it, it's a conveyor belt of, 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 uh, of volcanic activity that, 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 that moves so fast that we don't get highly evolved melts on Io. We don't get, we don't get highly, silicate, highly silica content lavas like we see on Earth. We don't get a, 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 a secondary crust forming or tertiary crust forming. So uh, it might be that Io is, is, is heated back to an extent where it's a primitive, a primitive interior composition, which is why it's interesting, because that would reflect the early Earth. Very interesting. Thank you. Great talk, Ashley. I have a question and a comment. Uh, the question is, given all of the, the, the modeling that you've done, and now it looks like we also see cryovolcanism, as you mentioned previously, in places like Titan, Enceladus, and Triton. To what extent can you apply the models that you've developed for sort of magma to cryo magmas? And then the comment is that today does happen to be the 14th anniversary of when Galileo did its plunge into Jupiter's atmosphere. So it's quite appropriate, I think, that you gave this talk tonight. Right. Yes. Um, the physics of the eruption and cooling and emplacement of cryo, cryo lavas. Uh, it, it's very similar to, 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 to the modeling that I've been doing. Uh, basically, it's just the, the physical inputs, values that, that are changing. So yes, and I, I've looked at the emplacement of cryo, cryo lavas on, on Titan and some of the effects on Enceladus as well. OK, we have some questions. Questions from the internet. So, Finding Freedom asks, 
Could debris and particles from Iris volcanic eruptions damage spacecraft orbiting or flying by the moon? Uh, the answer is yes, they could. Uh, Galileo itself uh, had its orbit, uh, its, uh, its, uh, its orbital trajectory uh, changed to avoid a large plume and ended up running into another plume. <laughs> just, <laughs> just the, that's just the way it is. Um, but uh, uh, it is possible to, to damage a spacecraft, and uh, that really depends on what kind of plume is erupting, how big it is, how much material has been incorporated into it. Uh, but your, your spacecraft is basically flying through this at about six or seven kilometers a second, so even small particles can do damage. Um, Alex asks, do the volcanoes act differently being directly exposed to the vacuum of space? And that's a good question. Um, on Earth, uh, Old Faithful uh, goes up about um, 30 or 40 meters. Um, on Io, uh, you put uh, under the same, same eruption conditions, uh, because you are erupting into a vacuum and because gravity is lower, if it was just gravity lower, the, the, the plume would be uh, six, six times higher. But because you're erupting into a vacuum, you get a much more expansion, you get much more bang for the buck, and Old Faithful will be 38 kilometers high. So erupting into a vacuum means that uh, if there's any gas uh, exsolving from the lava, you tend to erupt much higher velocities than on Earth, where things are a little controlled by uh, atmospheric pressure. And finally, Paige asks, is there topographical information about Io's lava lakes? I'd be curious to see the heights and depths of Loki Patera. Um, we have a pretty sparse data set where there's high enough resolution to make any kinds of measurements of, of lava flows and the lava lake. Uh, the lava lake just seems to be completely flat. We see specular reflection off the surface, which kind of enhances the idea that it is, in fact, a lava lake. Um, there is only one measurement, direct measurement, of the thickness of a lava flow on Io, and that is about 10 meters thick at a location called Palampatera, where there was a big eruption in 1997, which emplaced really large lava flows, which in the space of a few months covered 5,600 square kilometers. And these flows ended up about 10 meters thick, about 30 feet. Okay, that's the last question. Does anyone else, else have any, any questions? Well, thank you very much for coming tonight. Thank you.